Hello and welcome back to the third rail. We are going to have a look at the Merklin Remote Control Crane 7051 this week. We'll cover a bit of history, some working principles, what can go wrong and what to do to fix common problems. In other words, this is another little helper video. The Merklin Remote Control Crane was always one of my favorites. It is a must-have accessory for any Merklin enthusiast and a nice addition to any layout in terms of decoration or enhanced play factor. This video is going to be quite long. Of course, it can be watched in one sitting, but it is also meant to be used as a reference. So I have created chapters that will help you skip to the relevant topic. You'll find these at the bottom of your player now or in the video description. And whilst I have your attention, if you like the content of this video, please let others know by sharing it or simply using the like button. And if you don't want to miss any other videos like this one, please consider subscribing to the channel. It's free to you and it helps the channel in reaching a wider audience too. Let's start with a bit of history. This classic accessory was produced by Merklin for a period of over 55 years, during which it remained virtually unchanged. The first version came out in 1949 under model number 451G. The lifting, turning, the magnet and lighting were already remote controlled. The jib could be raised or lowered using a hand crank on the back of the cabin. The crane was also fitted with a search light located on the jib. 451G was superseded by a simplified model, the 451G2, in 1955. Merklin did away with the search light and the hand crank for the jib was replaced by a single arm with teeth. A new compact control box was also introduced. All these changes made the setup and operation of the model much easier. In 1956-57, version 3 was released under model number 7051, in line with the new numbering scheme adopted across the entire Merklin HO product range that year. Only a minor technical change was made in the process, consisting in a new hook type. This version was sold until 1979, when the fourth version was released. The changes made for this version were purely cosmetic. Only the color and lettering of the cabin were changed. This version remained on sale until the product was discontinued in 2004. Between 1990 and 1996, a digital version was also available under model number 7651. The color scheme for this version was different with a blue cabin and grey base. An analog version in this color scheme was also included with box set 29815 sold in 2001-2002. The packaging changed over the years, more or less in line with the evolution of the branding used by Merklin. 451G and G2 came in a grey cardboard box. After the introduction of the new numbering system, the box was changed to a yellow box like this one. For a short period in the late 1970s, a new artwork came on a yellow background, which changed to blue in the 1980s and finally during the 1990s a white box with plastic tray was adopted for the analog version and a grey box was used for the digital version. Looking at accessories, the crane was originally designed to lift loads from wagons. So Merklin produced a few models equipped with purpose-built loads that could be lifted by the crane magnet or hook. Here are a few examples. We have the 4520, 
the 4618, the 4614, I think there were a few others. Merklin didn't produce much in terms of add-ons for the crane itself. There was a below baseboard mounting kit, reference number 7054, which comprises of an extended transmission shaft and some spacers. This kit was made available to buy between 1994 and 2004. There was also a digital upgrade kit for the 7051, which was sold under reference number 7652 between 1994 and 2002. That's it as far as Merklin is concerned, but there were quite a few third-party products. Viad is probably the best-known brand, with scoops, noch, Faller and others also produced similar accessories. All these accessories can still be found relatively easily on auction and classified sites. In terms of build quality, this model is pretty bulletproof. Cranes are a bit like the turntable. Once the novelty effect has worn off, they usually see only very little use and are mostly there for decoration purposes. I too am guilty of this. The cranes I have installed on the layout hardly ever move. I have a 451 G2, which was a rescue dog. It came to me as a pile of parts, which I had to put back together. Then in the automated shunting area, I have a third version, so pre-1979, that came in its uh, 60s style yellow box. You get what you pay for, but in general, a boxed example is extremely unlikely to require more than a bit of maintenance to run properly. Additionally, most spare parts can still be found easily, albeit at a price. You can avoid unnecessary initial expenses by looking out for a few things when looking at classified or auctions listings. The most frequent annoyance is the control box. It often gets lost when layouts are dismantled. Additionally, the plastic the control boxes are made of often warps over time, rendering them unusable. Spare control boxes are not easy to find in a working condition and at affordable prices. A lot of sellers replace missing control boxes with the Merklin 7072 controllers to which crane control labels have been applied. These control boxes look identical but will only partially operate like the original controller. A telltale sign on the listing is the lack of pictures of the back of the control box. The original controller should look like this one, the offending one like that. Yes, I speak from experience. Another item that is often missing is the magnet. This is not really a problem, as compatible spares are available from Merklin or the trade under reference number E312387. The plugs will need to be swapped for older style Merklin plugs. Finally, you'll frequently see ads stating original paperwork is included, when in fact it is just a printout of PDF instructions or a photocopy of the original ones. Here is a version 4 of the crane I recently acquired in a blue box from the 1980s. I think the content is complete and original, so it's a good reference. It was described as follows in the auction listing. The crane is in excellent condition and was in working order before being boxed. The packaging is complete and in very good condition. Light wear. Well, the box has seen a bit of action and I wouldn't say it is in very good condition, but I can look past that bit. 
I particularly liked the it was working before being boxed bit in the description, which sounds nice but is most certainly seller talk for I haven't tested it. This elegant understatement is not a lie. After all, any mechanical object worked at some point in its life before being boxed, but it is very economical with the truth nevertheless. So I am expecting a few issues. At best, the crane will need some basic maintenance. At worst, it might need more involved surgery. Either way, this should give us a chance to get up close and personal and demonstrate common issues and fixes. So let's open the box and see what is expecting us. My first impression is that it looks like everything is there, as mentioned in the listing description. Let me get everything out. There we go. So we have the crane, the original instructions, the control box is original too, with its white control label from the 80s. The magnet is also the original one. You can see that because the plugs didn't have any plastic shielding at the time. Looking closer at the crane, the jib is straight, there's no breach anywhere or brakes, and we have a bent arm at the back of the cabin which will require a bit of attention. Looking at the cable loom, we have a few plugs missing, but they are all in a little bag in the box. Cool! So, I'll start by reattaching the plugs, and then we'll do a quick function test. So we're now ready to connect the loom to the control box. Good way to cover the most frequently asked questions about the crane if you look it up on forums. The crane is an accessory. In the Merklin system, control boxes for accessories distribute the power from the lighting circuit. That's the yellow circuit in the Merklin system. And that's the opposite from turnouts and signals for which control boxes are connected to ground, the brown circuit in the Merklin system. The control box outlets are color-coded, the red wires are for the lifting, the black wires are for the rotation of the cabin, and the yellow wire is for the magnet or light circuit. The brown cable connects to the ground or brown circuit on the transformer. If you haven't got the original control box and want to use other switches, you'll need to use momentary contact switches for the lifting and rotation of the crane. So that's the red and black wires. And you'll need a latching on-off type switch for the magnet or light in the cabin. Now that we are all set, we can try and give the crane a bit of power. The light is already on. Super! Uh, the crane doesn't turn though. Let's try the lifting. Let me disentangle the rope first. There we go. That bit works, but it doesn't sound very healthy. So, we'll need to do a bit of troubleshooting and maintenance. So, let's have a look at a few working principles. The crane is fitted with two universal motors with flat collectors, similar to the ones used in Merklin locomotives. Both motor armatures have a shaft with a worm gear that transfers the power to a long double shaft assembly using a few gears and clutches uh, which are fitted inside the base of the crane. The outer shaft turns the cabin, the inner shaft does the lifting. It isn't an intelligent accessory, so there are no limit switches or breakers anywhere. The motors or the lights stay on as long as the control panel button is pressed or left in the on position. The first thing to check are the brushes. 
which sometimes do not have contact with the collector. You can identify the motor easily by looking at the cables soldered to the winding, which should be the same color as the ones attached to the control panel. So I'll try and wiggle the brushes for the motor doing the rotation of the crane. And this doesn't change anything. I'm going to try and see if the control box is at fault. I'll simply try and feed power directly to each motor wire. And we have the same thing. No progress. Well, it looks like we need to investigate further and we are going to need to disassemble the crane for this. First, I need to remove the cabin and jib assembly. There is a large screw located on the side of the cabin. As it is not turning easily with the Merklin screwdriver, I choose a larger screwdriver I have to avoid damaging the screw and get a bit more leverage. There we go. Now, I need to free the uh, tower from the base. For this, I will need to remove the rubber feet under it. There are four of them. With them loosened, I can lift the tower. We have to be careful uh, not to uh, pull the yellow wire too much to avoid having to break the soldering iron out. Now, let's have a look at the motor. As mentioned before, it is built on the same principles as a locomotive motor. So we will have to take the brushes out and remove the motor plate. Well, that's in very good shape. I don't think the crane has been used much, if at all. Everything is practically spotless in the motor housing. Now, let's try and move the motor by hand. It is stuck. Since everything looks clean and straight, I think our issue is most likely resinification, also known as hardened oil. There are no gears within the motor housing, so the problem should be the worm gear shaft bearing behind the motor housing on the opposite side of the base. I will try and turn the armature with a bit more pressure to try and free the shaft, but this doesn't work. So I am going to use some oil to try and help the matter a bit more. I'll put a few drops on the shaft around the mouth of the bearing and in the little filling hole located above the bearing chamber in the base. I'm going to leave everything alone for a few minutes to allow the oil to penetrate. I could also have used some penetrating fluid or WD-40. If you are going down this road, just make sure whatever you're using is solvent-free to preserve the green paint on the base. Do not use any IPA here. We have waited 10 minutes and I can now try again and move the motor by hand. I apply some gentle progressive pressure to avoid damaging the armature and the motor is slowly beginning to move. Excellent! After a few more turns, the shaft is freed and I can take the armature out of the motor housing. We can see the hardened oil on the end of the shaft. I clean both ends with a cotton bud and a tiny bit of IPA. Then I'll apply some lithium grease and I'll reassemble the motor. The windings are a tight fit in this model, so it might take a few tries to get everything aligned properly so the locating pins fit in the corresponding holes in the base. There we go. And with the brushes back in, I can now give the motor a bit of power. I'll just use the lighting cable from the transformer. 
Yes, it works. Let's try the other direction. That works too. Excellent. Now I can repeat the exercise for the other motor. Brushes, screws, plate off, armature out, it's not stuck here, clean, grease, reassembly and test. All done. Now that the motors are operational, we need to look at the gears and shaft. We can see two worm gears from the motors uh, in the base. The uh, tower shaft is made of two parts that can turn independently from each other. The top gear at the base of the shaft is connected to one of the motors through a clutch gear and is used to turn the cabin. The bottom gear is connected directly to the worm gear of the second motor and is used for a winch located inside the cabin. I need to make sure that the clutch gear used to rotate the cabin is turning freely. I'll give the motor a bit of power and I can see that we have another problem. The top gear isn't turning. The motor worm gear should rotate the large gear located at the base of the clutch gear. This uh, gear is squeezed between two clutch plates which should rotate the shaft and the gear at the top of the shaft. The gear connected to the motor worm gear is turning and the shaft isn't. So it looks like another case of resinification to me. So I'm going to remove the top bearing plate and then try and pull the shaft to clean it. So I'll remove the screw, then wiggle the shaft gently to free it and I'll be able to put it out of its bearing. Again, I'll remove the old grease from the shaft with a cotton bud and a bit of IPA. I'll clean its bearing in the base too. Then I'll apply some fresh lithium grease and I'll reinstall the clutch. It needs to be installed as upright as possible to have good contact with the worm gear and be aligned properly with the transmission shaft for the crane cabin. Okay, quick test. We are operational again. So I reinstalled the top bearing plate, which is adjustable. I'll check that in a minute with a quick test. After removing the old grease from the tower shaft, I can now reinstall it, not forgetting the spring and washer that goes between the shaft and the base. I find it easier to slide everything on the end of the shaft, then hold everything in place with some tweezers and insert the shaft in its base bearing. There we go. Now I can loosely put the tower back on, then the cabin, I just hand tighten the screw for now and we can check if everything is working as it should. So we'll try and turn the cabin first. That works. Let's try the light and the lifting. Excellent. Now the magnet. Ah, we have a short. Ah, I forgot to put the isolating spacer between the cabin and the tower back in place. Let's try again. Magnet on. The tweezers are holding. Excellent. Actually, the magnet is so strong that the tweezers are magnetized now. Uh, I'll deal with this another time. OK, time for reassembly. We need to start with the side of the tower with a ladder. There are two locating holes for the ladder in the base of the crane. I'll first insert the end of the ladder 
in these holes, then I need to hold together both tower and base, then tilt them on their side, making sure I am still holding everything together firmly. If I let go of anything, this step might take a while. You see, if the tower comes loose, then the tower shaft will get dislodged, its spring and washer might fly somewhere I cannot see them, turning the entire process into a nightmare. So I am always very careful at that stage. Once that is done, I can proceed with reattaching the four rubber feet. Their screws will only fit properly if the little metal plates in the corner of the tower are held flat against the base. Once the first rubber foot is in place, I can finally let go of the base and proceed with the installation of the remaining feet with a lower heartbeat. I always leave a bit of play so I can reposition the tower before fastening the feet completely. The key here is to make sure that the tower shaft is at 90 degrees and that its gear has contact with the clutch shaft. Once done, I can then do a bit of cable management and try and put the lighting cable back in its original location. OK, we can now move our attention towards the cabin. The lifting arm is bent and needs straightening. If it is not done, it will collide with the tower and prevent the rotation of the cabin, or it might lower or raise the jib unexpectedly. There is a little screw at its end which acts as a stopper. It needs to be removed, then the arm can be pulled out through the roof. I can then straighten it back to a shape as straight as possible. No special tools needed. I can do this by hand or by pressing the arm against a straight surface. While we are here, we can have a quick look at the inside of the cabin. You would need to open it to replace the bulb or the rope, for example. Unless someone has been tinkering, that part of the crane doesn't require much attention, usually. With the lifting arm out of the way, the roof simply slides back. You might need to apply gentle pressure on the sides of the cabin for the roof to slide out easier. Looking inside, we have a ring on the base which would be attached to the outer tower shaft. Then we have the winch and its gearbox that is actuated by the inner tower shaft. Looking at the electrical part, at the top of the tower, we have a slip ring to which the yellow lighting circuit wire is connected. This slip ring allows the cabin to rotate freely without having to worry about cables becoming wrapped around the tower shaft. There is a pickup under the cabin that glides on the slip ring. It feeds the light bulb and live side of the electromagnet. The return to ground occurs via the body of the cabin and the tower shaft through the base of the crane. The bulb is changed by loosening and tilting the contact latch. OK, let me put everything back together and we'll check if everything is working as it should now. There we go. Because I have freed the clutch gear earlier, I can now rotate the cabin by hand. I'm going to position it over one of the corners of the tower so I can check the clearances of the lifting arm. I'll move the jib to several positions to check the arm doesn't come into contact with the tower. It doesn't, and that's cool. So now we can try the controls. Let's try and turn the crane. And it turns in both directions. The hook goes up and it goes down and the lighting goes on and off. 
the magnet is still operational. Job done. Excellent. Now, a few more things about the crane. As mentioned earlier in the video, it isn't a very intelligent accessory. There are no automatic breakers or limit switches, so any function will be switched on for as long as its associated control box button is active. This is not a problem for the cabin rotation, but one needs to be careful with the winch, as the hook might pull the jib upwards and potentially bend something in the process. With the magnet, the lack of breakers turns into a small safety issue. The electromagnet contains a coil, and leaving a coil under power for an extended period of time is never a good idea. It will get hot, and our crane magnet has a nice heat-conductive metal case. This combination can become finger-burning hot, so it is best to avoid skin contact in situations where the magnet was left continuously on for more than a couple of minutes. I use the light in the cabin as an on-off indicator for the magnet. Uh, this aspect is something to think about when children are visiting. I mentioned I rarely use the cranes, and this despite having designed wireless switches to control them. There is a link at the top of the screen if you are interested. The crane is simply not precise enough to position loads correctly when lowering them. And if by chance uh, one managed to achieve this, the tolerances of the load mounts on Merkling wagons are so tight that loads rarely end up sitting where they should. The hand of God will therefore almost always have to intervene. If I was going to use the cranes more frequently, I'd invest in some of the third-party accessories. I doubt the crane is precise enough for a container grabber, but a scoop for grabber loads or a simple grabber for other loose goods don't need to be precisely positioned, so would certainly enhance the play value. And when combined with wagons equipped with self-unloading mechanisms, for example the 4614 or one of its derivatives, I am pretty sure one could set up a nice little play scene that could turn out to be quite fun. Right, I think I have covered a lot of aspects. This video was meant to cover the most common issues, so I might have left one or the other thing out. It should be enough, though, to get any crane in good condition back up and running in no time. If you would benefit from additional information, please let me know in the comment section what topic is of interest. I'll either answer your comments straight away, or make a follow-on video if there is enough material to cover. If you have made it that far, thank you very much for watching and for all the subscriptions, likes and shares you have been kind enough to give me. I find this very rewarding and this keeps me going. They are also a good way to increase the reach of the channel, even with something as small as a like. Many thanks again for this and bye for now.